Now I'm going to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart because it attacked the underlying problem. In other words, we wanted to get something out there that at least when farmers were replacing all this 40 million acres, they would at least replace it with something that wasn't toxic but still performed well. So we took three, uh, most of the plant breeders like myself, we took three approaches. The first one was, well, well maybe we could just develop more persistent fungus-free varieties. They just need, you know, they've just been relying on this fungus for so long, they've evolved with this fungus. So maybe we should just find some that, uh, you know, that during breeding and selection, we can make them more independent of the endophyte and still as persistent as when they have the endophyte. Uh, the other one was, let's just take, like Kentucky 31, and just through breeding, re reduce that alkaloid level. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about this approach a little later because I can use it as a way to make a point. But both of these we tried, and we weren't quite as successful. I mean, I, that word distinguished, if I, if I had to go with what I did in these two things, we wouldn't be having distinguished written on there, I can tell you for sure. But, uh, but we just didn't make a lot of progress. Probably a better plant breeder could have, but uh, for each one of these, but we only, we only hit, we hit a wall out there that we couldn't overcome. But the third approach was, and it's, I got, we were going to reinfect. They, we were finding, uh, they were finding endophytes all over the world that were in fescue. They were, they were neotyphodium, but they did not produce the main alkaloids, the main ergot alkaloids. They were just natural mutants that didn't need, for some reason, didn't need ergot alkaloids during their evolution. So they are called non-toxic. They a zero level of ergot alkaloids. They also called novel or friendly endophytes. But but the goal of the breeding project was remove the toxic alkaloids to zero level in the seed. We'll get back to that seed thing in a minute. Zero level in the seed because that's going to be important. But retain the stand persistence. That was the goal, and by Taking the old endophyte out, putting the new endophyte in, doing some more breeding and a little bit of, a little bit of magic, you know, uh, we, we we would hopefully come up with a with a variety that would fit our needs. And it was a lot of work, but uh, we got our endophytes actually from a group in New Zealand. They had a bunch of endophytes. That was an interesting story too in itself. But uh, but anyhow, I I had found this guy in New Zealand. Uh, Gary Latch, who was doing a lot of work in perennial ryegrass. They had the same problem in perennial ryegrass, a little bit different problem, but different sets of alkaloids. But And he, I saw him at a meeting in France, and I, I told him, I said, man, I've got varieties that need endophytes, but they're all toxic. He said, well, I've got some endophytes that don't produce the ergot alkaloids. I said, I put my arm around him, you know, and we walked out. I didn't let him go for a long time because <laughs> we, uh, and then I went down to New Zealand and and actually infected a lot of my material with, with their endophytes. And, and actually what happened was we had a variety called Jessup that was a very tough variety, especially when infected. And it was a, it's a kind of a Kentucky 31 type. In fact, as far as we can tell, it's probably derived, essentially derived from Kentucky 31. And uh, we had one of their best strains from Ag Research in New Zealand called AR542. And uh, that became Max Q. And so why Jessup? Uh, well, this, uh, I don't know if you can see it in the back, but that green is Jessup, and that's Kentucky 31, that's Triumph, and in a tough areas of South Georgia, we can get it to survive. It's just a very tough variety over a wide geographic range. And when you introduce a variety in the first time, it's good to have one that's buffered across a lot of environments. And this one was, so that was one reason we selected it as the main host variety. And then uh, these are the guys at Ag Research in New Zealand I was working with, and this is Latch right here. Uh, great thing about this project is I got to go to New Zealand several times. That's really nice for a forage guy. It's kind of like, you remember that sh sh uh, story where the guy said, is this a uh, heaven? And he said, no, it's Iowa. <laughs> well, a, a, for a forage guy goes down there and it's like, is this heaven? He said, no, this is New Zealand. You know, so you, you'll just see great pastures, great climate, and great people. It's, it's really an interesting place. But we looked at a lot of their strains. I just got several, uh, just three of them mentioned here. The main thing we were looking at then, when you compare E plus and E minus Jessup, uh, was that you the relative value. I just got it all relative. You wanted the high survival 
But fungus free, you wanted the low alkaloids. So we looked for strains that didn't produce the alkaloids, and just about all of them didn't. And, and yet, but we wanted something that nicked real well with our variety, that, that when we put it in our variety, it mimicked its natural endophyte. And so this 542 came as close. It's probably going to be hard to see this, but um, so you see a lot of grass here, and then by the number of weeds, that yellowing here, that's mostly weeds and that endophyte free. And then this one had, so we saw this a lot. So we, that was the first thing we had to prove, that it was a good host, that it was transmit through the seed at a high level, and that also when it was put out in, in, in the field and in tough environments, it would survive about as well as the, as the E plus would. So that's, that was the one step, that was one part of the process. The other one, uh, and that became 542, then became max Q. Uh, the other one was animal safety, and this got to be really cumbersome, and Mark McCann, I'd say, did all this work. <laughs> I was just out there helping. Uh, Mark, uh, we did the lamb trials, and, and I think you sheared a lot of lambs to get us out there, and got, went out to Texas and got them and everything. So, uh, But this was a classic picture. So here are these lambs out here grazing. Just a fence, netted fence, and these are trying to cool themselves on, you know. It was a classic, classic effect. But what we saw was, whatever we looked at, we, we would see things like blood prolactin, again, this is just the one I showed you before, that Max-Q mimicked fungus-free and didn't respond like E+. That's what we wanted. So, so as we look, then, of course, you know, we've had to step up into other animal groups. Uh, well, this is just the game itself. And, and you know, what you're seeing is there's a, the gain, as far as per head per day, was, you know, on these lambs, you know, it's pretty dramatic. I mean, it's 50%, 60%, sometimes 100% better gains on fungus-free or max-Q than it was on E+. So it was going right to the bottom line, too. But this is, again, a safety trial, and we were just looking at things to make sure we didn't have toxicity because that was the real problem with coming out with a novel endophyte is that you're, you're saying that it's not toxic. That's a pretty dramatic statement, and you better prove it's not, and not only just in lambs, but in cattle and in horses and goats, and, you know, whatever else you got to do, and that's one reason there was so much work done on it. Here's our here's a cattle trial. Uh, if this was one person, uh, Mark, that'd be you out there. I think. <laughs> think you were you weren't out there that day, but uh, anyhow, that's uh, you can see this is this one I just took. Uh, this was the E plus cattle, and in the next pasture over were the Max Q cattle. Hot day out there grazing. Others are hugging the things, trying to cool themselves down. So again, even when we went to beef cattle, we had a good proof of concept. The gains, whether in the spring of thing, were anywhere from, again, 50% to almost 100%. Better gains. And this was another one that uh, Richard Watson, one of Mark's uh, postdocs, was looking at, too. We were able to monitor the body temperatures. And you can see on those toxic pastures, for those body temperatures, they couldn't, you know, they finally cool themselves down to normal, and then, man, it just go, and it'd be all day long. They were just hot all day long, and, and yet the animals that were on Max Q and, and on Funkus Free, they were, they were just running normal. So these are the kind of proof of concepts we had to do, animal safety trials, to, to get persistence that we wanted, but at the same time trying to remove. And, and again, we had some of the same information on horses, and, and the pregnant mares, etc. So, what's happened since then? When I went to Oklahoma, one of the main things we were looking at out there was to develop the same thing for that western zone that we had done for the eastern zone. And, and uh, so we came out uh, and developed a, a new variety called Texoma. And then uh, they had a new endophyte that uh, it was a little more robust endophyte, stayed in the seed better, um, you know, was more hardy. And uh, it's a 584 was the strain. And so now there's a new product out called Texoma Max Q2, and it's really better for that western zone. 
But anywhere, it seems to be doing well about anywhere we're testing it, even in the east, even though we tested a lot in the east. But it's, uh, it definitely was designed for those lower rainfall zones. And it seems to have a little better. Uh, Texoma itself was uh, selected in a very low rainfall zone. So it's a, it's a summer active Kentucky 31 type, but now there is a new one out there. So that's where we are. So I brought you up to speed from the, you know, early all the way to now.